Captain Blade was the most feared pirate on Pandora long, long ago. Through treasure hunting missions, we can find the gear he used to become so infamous. Today, we ask ourselves, can you beat Borderlands 2 as Captain Blade? Now, obviously, Captain Blade isn't a playable character in Borderlands 2, but his gear scattered throughout the pirate DLC can make us pretty close to the real thing. And all of these items are cursed and provide some type of negative effect on us. To list them off real quick, the rapier makes getting punched hurt more, the orphan maker just plain out hurts to shoot, the manly man shield makes elemental damage hurt more, the auto idol makes fight for your life shorter, and the midnight star ejects child grenades towards the player. Now they do have benefits, but some are just not that helpful. The rapier is the best melee weapon in the game, but since we're on OP10, melee isn't really viable, especially on a gunzerker. The manly man shield adds 40% explosive damage to our melee attacks, but it's also quite useless. The auto idol returns health upon kill, but it's only like 8%, and if the orphan maker is our main source of damage, it pretty much cancels it out for that one shot. And the orphan maker's damage output is pretty good, so we have that going for us. And the midnight star has... Uh... Wait, what does the Midnight Star have? Increase damage and reduce child grenade count. Huh. Anyway, we're also going to be using a Legendary Hoarder class mod to keep on theme with pirate stuff, and it helps us Gunzerk more, so all curses can be active at once. Alright, really quick on the rules. Geared OP10 challenges are my style, so that's how we're going to go about it. All skills are allowed with discretion as to not avoid the challenge. No bar. And lastly, no left-handing the Orphan Maker. The reason for that last rule is because the self-damage doesn't trigger when left-handing, which would defeat the purpose of the run, and Mom ain't raised no game exploiting bitch. Okay, on to the run. First thing I did was choose my skills. I chose Asbestos to counteract the Manly Man Shield, and because of the cool gas mask icon, I also picked up Fistful of Hurt and Double Your Fun, I don't play the Gunzerker too often, so the rest of my build was trash. I really want to go back in time and slap myself for not grabbing no kill like overkill. Most of the beginning of the run was spent learning how not to die, and how to properly go about fights. It was immediately apparent that my fight for your lifetime was short, and 9% slag chance is absolutely infuriating. Also, I literally never played the Gunzerker on PC before, so I had to get used to a lot of dumb shit, like the inconceivable glitch where your guns don't auto-reload after they're empty. I really hate that one. And most importantly, I had to learn the shot pattern of the Orphan Maker. Usually this gun is pretty good, but the Jacob stock makes the accuracy recovery extremely low. Seven quick and brutal deaths in, I realized I forgot to turn my bar off, so we had to restart. Luckily I caught it early, I'd probably need a straight jacket if it happened any later. This time around, I decided to try and use some grenades, and well, that didn't go too great. I also tested how much self damage the Orphan Maker does. Usually Borderlands gameplay goes, I shoot them and they die. But this time around, it went, I shoot them and we die. So if I don't have any shield, I'm practically not allowed to shoot my gun. I didn't fully learn this lesson until deep into this run though. Making my way to Boom Boom, I tried the Midnight Star again, and just like before, it was actually worthless. So to add to the challenge, I decided that the grenade mod wasn't allowed to come off. So grenade jumps were out of the question. Boom Boom was ready to blow, and I was ready to go. Psych, I got pooped on. Boom, as always, gave me a little bit of trouble before I got lucky and took him out. Boom, on the other hand, killed me many times. I was constantly seeing the blue respawn screen, so I decided to put my new blue light glasses on. Alyssa got them for me recently and said they were for when I was bad at Borderlands. Honestly, best gift ever. Anyway, Boom had too much health regen for my DPS to handle, mainly because I had to take long pauses so my guns didn't kill me. 38 deaths in, I got desperate and found something that will change my challenge runs forever. What? I didn't know I could do this. Dude, I wish I would have known this for my last run. The new strat of getting within neck snapping range worked great. I just lined the psychos up so they couldn't hurt me and started going to town. 
Also, here is a slagged armored enemy taking nothing but critical hits by this corrosive rapier, and it's doing nothing. This is just for reference on how little damage this thing does. Good thing we had the Orphan Maker though, because this wouldn't have been possible without it. After getting misted by my first monster shotgun of the run, we were off to fight Flint. You can't see it, but the word fight has quotations around it in my script. It also says something about foreshadowing, but that word has too many syllables for me to understand. A common problem I would face in this run is getting shot down to low health right before I tried to shoot the Orphan Maker, making me die. Another common problem was thinking the Midnight Star would actually work this time around. All these issues were building up, and day one of this challenge was really breaking me. I've never been closer to giving up than I was during the Flint fight. The health regen mixed with me always taking damage from other people made this fight impossible. I had one last idea before I was going to throw in the towel. Earlier in the run, I said something I was totally wrong about. Melee, 10. Melee cell on OP10 don't exist. Okay. Yeah, you've seen that, right? In one last desperate attempt to best flint, I managed to find the cheesiest cheese ever. I call it flint locking. Knocking him out of his arena makes him really confused, and he won't try to attack you anymore. And if you try to knock him into the water, this happens. We might have done Flint bolder than Lenny from Of Mice and Men, but he would have the last laugh after tricking me into thinking I got a legendary and jumping into the cold water below. This point of the run was both the victory and the mental health boost. The amount of laughing that occurred from everything that just happened really helped. After that whole fiasco, we had to get the power core for Sanctuary and kill 20 bandits for Reese like the good Vault Hunter we are. And Sanctuary, as always, was no challenge for obvious reasons, so let's get to Frostburn Canyon. Running past every enemy in this place is always satisfying. I always wish that the game had some type of bee hopping mechanic that would let you keep momentum if you time your jumps good. Like imagine if you grenade boosted for speed, and then you could just keep the momentum. That would be dope. Okay, I'm getting a little off track. Anyway, I tried doing the spike jump skip for the first time ever, and I nailed it, making my success rate 100% get flexed on, and fighting through the psychos here wasn't bad. Melee Sal even worked for a little bit. This might be common knowledge, but if you don't want Lilith getting in your way, I found that fighting on the bridge makes things a lot easier. Up next, we were supposed to get bandit car pieces, which I did, I just forgot to hit record, and when I tried to get the short clips of it from my Twitch VOD, the VOD was just gone, I guess? Which sucks, because I got this pearl from a tubby, I just don't have the clip of it. Anyway, here's a fun fact. The saw blades from Bandit Technicals count as melee damage. So if you have a melee boosting skill or any type of gear that boosts melee damage, they take effect here. You can see that my saw blades are doing bonus explosive damage and that's from the Manly Man shield. You could try this with a Love Thumper shield and it gets pretty crazy. Anyway, back to the run. Bad Ma was our next mini boss to take out. The fight wasn't bad as soon as his meat shields broke loose. Hubert was my helper this time around, and he was so excited to be free that my man started breakdancing. The Bloodshot Stronghold was one of those mobbing areas that felt really hard for some reason. It may have just been the number of ironclad psychos and shield nomads, but I'm also just bad at the game. I also felt kind of bad for killing these two during a private moment. Oh yeah. But everyone else had it coming. Especially Mad Mike. The guy just wouldn't die, and the fact that his corrosive launcher did extra damage because of my shield wasn't helping. After a few tries, I realized that he wasn't even a mandatory fight, and the door to the next area was open. So I decided that flushing him like the turd he was was totally fair. After saving Roland from getting kidnapped, we had to save Roland from getting kidnapped, which means the warden was our next target. If you decide to try this challenge, which, save file in the description if you want, it is imperative that you kill Warden before he goes to the Gulag. Be patient, be smart, and don't worry, he doesn't have health regen. 
You need to kill him first try or it's pretty much over. My mistake here was going for the kill instead of taking out that surveyor. If I were to have killed Warden here, it would have saved me hours. But I didn't, and now it was time for pain. Gulag Warden may seem like the same fight, but it's actually harder. Usually shooting Warden in the eye will stop any construction it is doing, but in the Gulag, you actually get ultimate loaders moonshot at you as well. Meaning getting close enough to do damage without dying is pretty much impossible. It wasn't until I realized that the loaders put me on their casting couch that the dread set in. Like holy sh I really looked like I was gonna cry here. I tried a multitude of different strats, resetting the map to get a jump on the warden, running around the map and doing run by shootings, looking for cheese spots, but nothing was working. I had a few options. I could be a baby and reset the mission with a save editor to retry the bloodshot damn fight, but the same thing could just happen again. I could be a man and reset the whole playthrough because that would be more legit, or I could be a true man and live with my mistakes. With that being said, the final strat was devised. Step one, break loaders kneecaps to slow them down. Step two, eliminate most loaders to have only four on the field. Warden will only spawn up to a certain amount. Step three, be smart and patient and do damage when it is a safe option. Even with this strat, the fight was tough. There was an angelic guardian dual wielding Vladoff snipers that really messed me up and I just wasn't able to kill it. So I just tried avoiding it. Eventually the loaders got confused and stopped pursuing me for some reason. And I was able to slowly take out Warden from afar. I don't know why they stopped pursuing me right here. It's almost like Borderlands was meant to be played faster or something and they just ran out of AI. Either way, I got really f***ing lucky right here. I really hope I never have to go to the Gulag again. Tundra Express was our next destination. The usual order of operations ensued there. Sing Campfire Song with Varkids, meet Mordecai, meet Tina, and try to grenade jump with the Midnight Star. Pretty basic stuff. I was a little overzealous and forgot to grab the damsels, so that was kind of cringe, but oh well. It was time to fight Wilhelm, and I was prepared for an intense battle. I planned to take him out in my first attempt. Well, it. I really didn't know that the train could just delete you like that. Well, guess I'm adding that to the random Borderlands facts part of my brain. Anyway, the actual Wilhelm fight was a good fight. Wilhelm in particular is a pretty fair boss, which is ironic because everyone is so surprised when he dies. The best approach to dropping this guy when your gear is bad is to just keep your distance and kill off the loaders. After that, keep your eyes in the sky to see where the scatter missiles go and always leave one surveyor for second wins. Any more than that, the shield regen gets to be counterproductive and it also tricks him into making more, which sets up for easy crits. But most importantly, practice your train dodging before you go in and fight him. Do all that and he should go down relatively easy. After dooming Sanctuary and a not so quick run through the fridge, we were finally to the highlands. My brain at this point was hyper focused for no damn reason, so I was zooming past loaders and constructors alike. This actually helped me learn a new strat though. Dealing with the tickle monster is way easier if it's distracted by loaders, so taking him out was relatively easy as well. Protecting the kidney stone it dropped was a completely different story. For those of you who are too good at the game to know, the beacon can only be destroyed 8 times before it just becomes invincible. I still attempt to protect the beacon in my challenge runs, but it is usually just a waiting game. After a few unfortunate deaths, the fast travel landed, and I made a break for it. Our reunion with the Sanctuary Squad was short-lived, as Rowling gave us the bad news. We had to go to the preserve. If you've seen my other runs, you know that nothing but pain resides here. Also, if you've watched my other videos, there's a 97% chance you aren't subscribed. So if you like the vids, please consider hitting that sub button. It helps the channel a lot and really motivates me to make these videos. Anyway, back to the run. I needed to mentally prep for the preserve, and by mental prep, I mean shotgunning three monsters in the span of two minutes. This was the run where I finally figured out how wounding loaders worked. It's not severing body parts like I originally believed, but it's actually just dealing enough damage to them. Which sucks when they have health regen. It's all really weird. Dying while they're wounded though makes it so that the counter doesn't go down, so theoretically you can wound the same loader three times if you die. I don't know, all I know is that my blood was practically battery acid at this point, so I needed a physical health boost to counteract my mental health boost. 
The solution was simple. Three monsters plus two grilled cheese equals one monster. Disclaimer time, I'm not a mathematician, nor am I a dietitian, but I do know that a lot of caffeine is not good for you, so please don't try this at home. Make sure you're at a hospital first. After slamming those sandwiches in under a minute and burning my mouth in the process, we plowed right through the rest of the preserve. It seemed as the preparation was working because I was punching pup skags into mist. The only real setback that made me mad was this jump. Like I made the jump right here, but after having to come back through, I just couldn't hit it again. Dumb problems aside, it was time for the fight with my arch rival. Spoiler alert, it sucked. Psych! Fire. That bird, she got messed the Fire. f*** up! The main difference with this challenge opposed to my other ones was the ability to actually kill things. Yeah, I might be in a fight for your life in order to spam my orphan maker, but at least I'm taking the heathens with me. Also, Cell's insight skill makes dodging Bloodwing actually possible sometimes. I managed to take out Bloodwing in only three tries. Lil Gas Mask 1, Bloodwing 2. I still got bodied the last few challenges. After that victory, it was time to go find Mordecai's last remaining friend and then kill all of his friends. A combo of tough guys gave me some trouble, but I managed to glitch one out and it made things a lot easier. These guys often have Nova shields, so the key to giving them the sauce is to make sure you dodge the blast. After a few more little dudes, it was time to take on the final boss, Goliath Jackson. My mans was really moonwalking on me every time he had the chance. After a while, the smooth criminal met his fate. As for the secret ending boss, I decided we're going to kill him melee Sal style. Dual wielding rapiers gives us enough DPS to actually melee kill him, but that wasn't cool enough. We wanted to send him packing. Fighting loaders with Brick was actually pretty fun, mostly because he was a distraction and I got to punch an ion loader off a cliff. Fuck ion loaders. But our next task is where the run started to hurt again. Jack's body double was next on our hit list. If you watched me play live before, you probably have heard me call the heathens that run and hide cowards. The Jack double is the ultimate coward. His cowardice was so extreme that he ended up disappearing entirely, leaving me to reset the map. The strategy for taking him out was brute force and lack of patience, which worked. After an hour of attempts, with that Fire. show out of the way, we're on to the next one. The way to bunker is always hard, this time was no exception. I think jet loaders are moving up a tier on the most hated loaders tier list because they're the biggest cowards of them all. Fly away now. Fire. I also got bodied by this loot homie that didn't even drop anything. But the constructor was the real challenge. I was trying to kill this thing for a while. It was to the point where the beginning loaders started respawning and making it even harder. So I did what I do best. Find an obscure cheese strat for enemies that you should never have to cheese. The strat at hand? Constructor Displacement. When this chunky dumpster is spawning, it likes to keep awkward eye contact with you, meaning you have a small amount of time to angle it to your liking. It's best to run up to the left of him so he's facing the door you need to open. This way, when he fires his missiles, they end up hitting the door before they can start tracking you, making for a much easier fight. The usually invincible baby turrets were only a minor annoyance this time around. After that, a wise man said wise words, I shotgunned another battery, watched the most awkward teabag of my life, cheesed the Omega dump truck, and started testing face McShooty. At first, I wasn't sure what gun to use, but I decided to use the Orphan Maker. Reason being, is I might redo a melee version of this challenge in the future, so the rapier can be tested at a later time. So basically, this took well over an hour. Early on, I found a strat that made it easier though. I would get my health really low, so inconceivable would proc more often, and spam shots until my shield was at its lowest before breaking. This was a bit risky though, and I ended up dying three times. Like... Imagine dying to face McShooty even once. Anyway, I finally landed a shot, and it was time to face Bunker's turrets. Irony came to play when the usually weak big turrets were the challenge, opposed to their baby man counterparts. The first 10 were fine, but this last one killed me several times. This turret wasn't slaggable for some reason. My guess is that glitch where slagging an enemy before they fully spawn makes them unslaggable. The most common example is slagging loot homies before they land on the ground. Or maybe I just had absolutely no luck. 9% slag chance never came through. 
Honestly, both are believable. After a lot of patience, it finally died, and it was time to take on Bunker. The fight wasn't that intense, if I'ma be real. I had a couple close calls, but the underside of the arena is super safe. Found a cool thing with ion loader domes where you can walk on the bottom side, but that's just random and not helpful. 35 minutes in, Bunker perished, and it was time for another shotgun. This time around, I tried to race with gravity. The goal was to finish the monster before Sal hit the bottom of the elevator. The result? Bad. The f cap twisted on me. I couldn't open the top quickly enough. I feel like I could have had it, but now I gotta wait till the next challenge run. Angel Core was actually going great. I surprised myself when I was able to take out Angelic Guards for the first time, which made me believe this part was possible. After a good chunk of mobbing, the last injector was finally exposed and it was invincible. No biggie, I'll just reset the map and... Oh. Okay, I guess the mobbing wasn't that bad. I'll just do it again and then destroy the... What the f- Okay, I'll leave out the door so it doesn't reset the fight and... Oh, brother, come on! Wow, a third time. Who would have guessed? Alright, Calm Gas Mask is back. So this was actually a hard lock. I literally couldn't proceed. On the third attempt, I noticed that the injectors respawn for some reason. I don't know why, but I thought that this might mess up the game, so I tried a fourth time, and I did it under 25 minutes, which is the time it takes for mobs to respawn, and it still was busted. Three whole f***ing hours of Angel Core, and one hour of troubleshooting gived to make the mission complete, we figured it out. Alright, with that covered, it is time to cover Sawtooth. I f***ing hated this too. The ambush commanders actually spawn camped me for a while, and I was having trouble getting shots on them. My most viable strat was to get up close and fight for your life and spam the Orphan Maker. This wasn't a guaranteed kill though. After getting tenderized like a steak for a while, I managed to kill three of four of them, and the last guy was glitched out of bounds. Aw oh, great, more glitches. My favorite. I thought I had a simple fix. I really thought I could just reset the map on this one, which I did, and I only still had to kill one. But four of them spawned! All at once! On the bright side, I only needed to kill one. After that, a cowardice buzzard killed me, and I found a weird glitch where if you die in the elevator, you'll respawn on the elevator. It was kind of weird. After finally taking the buzzards out in one of my most grueling sawtooth runs, it was time for the final sprint. Every time I go to the boneyard, I rewire my brain for its prime directive. Locate valve, crank. Locate valve, crank. Locate valve, crank. After they were cranked, we telefragged the pipe and went to the Badlands. With the amount of mental deterioration these runs put me through, being able to turn my brain off for a bit helps, especially right before the big fight. It was also my birthday, so Alyssa made me baby plum cupcakes. Hashtag wholesome moment. Anyway, I usually run right past Saturn, but since I did that last time, and I really didn't want to deal with him firing at me, I decided we would kill him this time. Now I could have patiently killed Saturn with the Orphan Maker, but I really wasn't about that action. So I propped my Powerade bottle up on my mouse and killed Saturn while I bodied people in Smash Bros. Passive income, man. It will change your life. I bodied Saturn and Mr. Game & Watch practically at the same time. Killing Saturn made retrieving the data a lot easier. It was now time for the final stretch before Jack and the Warrior. Fighting the loaders with Claptrap went like most loader fights. I would kill a few, die, then repeat. This time around though, I was smart, and I baited out the super surveyors by severing their homies' limbs. I also found a couple of war loaders dabbing, and I wasn't about to let that amount of cringe exist in the same realm as me any longer. Like, bro, I'm already here. Quit trying to steal my spotlight. I somehow managed to get through this fight with relative ease, but a couple of bull loaders actually started rolling me. Yeah, I was really nailing this part of the Captain Blade cosplay. I would say bullet deflection, bad slag luck, and the weird double shot explosive thing these guys always have amounted to just the right amount of obnoxiousness. And my choice of gear played absolutely no factor in these fights whatsoever. After they were dealt with, the rest got a little easier. 
I might be a buffoon for thinking that the Midnight Star could get one kill before the run ends, but Mardo and Brick are true homies and backed me up. While Mardo was slagging the enemies, Brick and I were beating them to scrap metal. Happy feet! Wombo combo! That ain't Falco! That ain't Falco! Oh! Oh! oh, oh. And after Mordo took out the turrets, the rest of the enemies became optional. The final fight with Jack was upon us, and like most of the runs so far, some weird cursed <laughs> went down. What you're watching is a 40 minute fight sped up a whole lot. As you can see, his shield isn't really dropping. So when I eventually died, I needed a large refresher to keep me motivated. It was my <laughs> birthday. I was gonna kill this <laughs> Shortly after the break, I thought of something. Mmm. I didn't expect him to be so tanky. Can you spawn with different shields? What happens if the lava touch your no-no square? Hot balls. Oh, what the fuck? What the f yeah, so I guess my man's had a turtle shield on or something stupid. I don't even know anymore. Even with his shield down, there was still a challenge at hand. His health regen far surpassed my ability to keep up with him and stay alive. It seems like I would run off to recover health and he would have the same idea. Except he was better at it. Out of pure desperation not to lose the run this far in, I decided to make the playing field more suitable for the fight. I started punching loaders into the lava, not to kill them, just to get them out of the way, and shortly after Jack just stopped. Yeah, I'll play most of the kill right here. I'm not really sure why he did this. My guess was he probably realized it was my birthday and decided to give me the win, but it's likely that this fight was just being glitchy like it always is. Either way, I got the kill, and it was time for the true final boss. This time around, I decided to take him on from a different spot than usual, but the same shoot monster till he dies strategy was used. After a few fails by the hands of crystalisks, the warrior assumed fate acceptance position. Or so I thought. He tried to pull one last trick on me, but luckily I'm a very paranoid individual, so my guard was already up. Once his health bar was finally down to practically nothing, I seen my chance to get a kill with the midnight star. The final boss, taken out with the worst grenade ever created, all to finish off this treacherous sip. Nah, psych, it failed on me again. On top of that, I killed the warrior while left-handing the orphan maker. I decided that since I was in fight for your life, the self-damage wouldn't have really did anything, so I let this one slide. The warrior dropped a terrible leech, and I finished Jack off with the obvious choice of weaponry. The proof is here. You can't beat Borderlands 2 as Captain Blade, even on your birthday. All right, don't go yet. I got some bonus content for you guys. Really quick though, it'd be awesome if you guys subbed, liked, and commented on this video. It really helps with YouTube's algorithm, and I also love hearing what you guys have to say. My Twitch and Discord links are also in the description if you want to check those out. Alright, now let's shiver some timbers. The pirate DLC plays a lot like normal Borderlands 2. You just get pirate shanties stuck in your head more often. Things started out a little rough, but after outplaying the last few pirates action movie style, our first real test arrived. So no beard always spawns with this corrosive stink pot rifle, so we had to dance our way around this one. On the bright side, the guy's got no beard and two left feet, so taking him out was pretty easy. After talking to the most talented ventriloquist on Pandora and fending off a very angry Alfredo noodle, we finally had our first aircraft, I, er, I mean sand skiff which we properly flew into a bigger boat so that we could in return shoot the smaller boats. Whole lot of boatception. Upon meeting Scarlet, she said that we needed to put Sandman to sleep, so we were off to his lair. On the way there, we also dug up another rapier because I wanted to find all the treasures as a bonus challenge. I don't know why I added more challenges, because Big Sleep and Sandman were actually pretty f annoying to fight. Well, Sandman actually died like a baby man, but Big Sleep is just a dumb boss. Like most enemies I despise, Big Sleep has this undodgeable chain attack that can even hit through walls. On top of that, the guy can just hit the f***ing woe out of nowhere and deflect my bullets that, may I remind you, already hurt to shoot. A little over a dozen deaths later, I had to bring out the special weapon, the gas mask. And before anyone asks, yes, this gear is also cursed. Whoever wears this thing becomes unbelievably sexy. 
at the cost of undying masochistic urges. With my breath steadied, brain cleared, and on the 666 death mark, I noticed something. For some reason, Big Sleep completely whiffed his melee attack right here while I was standing on this crate. Being the large cranium the lad I am, I instantly knew what to do. A simple confusion strat was all it took to take on this heathen. Also, he dropped the 12 pounder, so that was pretty cool. After we dug up our orphan maker and manly man shield, we raided this Hyperion caravan. Nothing too eventful, just your average Sea of Thieves gameplay experience. Grabbing the auto idol was more significant than talking to Herbert, so I'll include that instead of him. But our next destination was Washburn Refinery, where even robots can be cowards. There was a group of two super loaders that took about 20 minutes to kill, and then there was Hurley, who took two minutes to kill. Gearbox did my boy Hurley pretty bold when it comes to balancing. The main attack that makes him unique does 4 damage, on top of that you can blow his arms off making him the easiest boss in the game. With all 4 parts of the compass found and or jerry rigged, it was time to set off to the lighthouse. Here we found the last treasure we needed, the midnight star. Way to save the best for last am I right? Surprise surprise, Scarlet betrayed me and sent her biggest cowards after me. They really said I am about to head out as soon as I needed a revive. Nothing too hard, but the lieutenants did mess me up quite a bit before I managed to take them out. We somehow photobombed our own POV of getting eaten and fought Roscoe the Rack Hive. Thinking about it now, the Leviathan has some type of turducken situation going on. Like for real, you have the Rack inside of the Rack Hive, and then the Rack Hive inside the Leviathan? I don't know, I'm probably thinking too deep into this. Anyway, Roscoe was a bigger baby than Sandman, both figuratively and literally, so he died in like 40 seconds. The Leviathan, though, was a whole different story. At first I was bombarded by sandworms and their deadly corrosive spit, but then after I respawned, they just disappeared. I don't know why, but it was just 10 minutes of dodging rocks and shooting his eyes and heart. After that was done, a whole wave of worms popped up, and I just took them out from a safe spot. It was a very slow process, mostly because when they go underground, they remove any slag applied to them, and, you know, the whole 9% slag, yeah, you get it. After all that, I had to fight not one, but two sandworm queens before the leviathan showed its neck. It would have been so simple. I just had to kill the last weak spot, but I left handed. I had no excuse this time. It was tempting to let it slide, but I had to do what was right. Resetting the fight was the only option. So I did this 20 minute fight about three times before the leviathan finally perished. Which means... You can beat Captain Scarlet and her pirate's booty as Captain Blade. Alright guys, that's going to wrap up the video and the bonus content. I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. And until next time, breathe easy homies.